सर प्लीज आप स्टार्ट कर सकते हैं ओके ओके थैंक यू अंकुर सो वेलकम बैक टू दिस लेक्चर सीरीज एंड टुडे विल टॉक अबाउट द इंट्रोडक्शन टू जियोग्राफिक इंफॉर्मेशन सिस्टम as it is popularly known as gis uh, so you know we'll learn the basic ideas and concepts of the gis how it is used uh, where do we apply what kind of data sets are you know are dealt with and what kind of you know processing is required to understand that i'll try to make it as simple as possible you know uh, uh, so that it is understood by people who have Who are rather new to this whole concept, uh, but yeah, let me try. So uh, the you know the GIS you know is primarily a concept, right? Uh, we'll come to the tools part a little bit, and you know it is defined as an art, science, engineering, and technology, which is associated with answering all kinds of geographical questions. Wherever you want to answer a question. which has a spatial context geographical context you can do that you know and there are uh, so many modern tools now to uh, to analyze the data in a gis framework and also to uh, you know visualize this you know uh, you know as as a digital on, on a digital platform for example a geologist can ask what is the pattern of the earthquakes you know and you know he can plot the data at a global scale or at a country scale and show you the patterns of the earthquakes in a given region for example a hydrologist can ask what is the pattern of the pollutant spread for example again uh, using the necessary data to uh, to understand the patterns of the pollutants he can display that information on on your screen you know to to show that kind of a spread similarly a climatologist can ask how is the change in the ozone hole spreading or reducing for example a politician can ask about the population of a particular constituency so all of these questions are related to some you know geographical context and you know of course the data the, the related data has to be in there uh, to you know to allow you to answer these questions and that is what we'll talk about and but the back end of the process is is that it is asking you you are asking these questions in a certain way and the answers are being provided that's basically what gis is all about a forester can ask how is the spread of a forest fire is you know in a given region for example so as you can understand all of these questions are concerned with some kind of a geographical pattern and of course the process understanding you know some process is there and by which you analyze the you know that and then you answer these questions so let's see how it works so any gis practically has you know four components of course it starts with the spatial data uh, so any spatial data which is required for this it can be a remote sensing data for, for that matter we have talked about that in the last couple of lectures and that data or it can be a map it can be population density it can be forest it can be vegetation anything so now that kind of spatial data is then processed you know uh using various kinds of softwares uh you know and then uh you know that processing might involve some coding which you may or may not be able to do but then uh, there are now softwares already available for doing that and those codes those coding will then allow you to visualize that data in a, in some sort of presentation mode that is the gis part of it right so you're not you know really doing that you know back end processing but you know the system is already designed for you all you need to do is to put in the necessary data and design the uh, desired question which you want to ask that's what the gis is all about okay now the roots of the gis uh, you know is comes from you know a really long long way you know uh, it was you know the, it was started off with the data analysis and the display tools because when we started using the uh, using the computers 
and then we wanted to handle and analyze the map data, we you know, started learning tools for displaying that. So that's when the GIS part of started. Then, of course, the maps have been there you know, with us you know, for a long, long time. Uh, you know, generally as an as a, as a paper form, and then when the digitization started, when the digital cartography started, we started automating you know uh, these maps, and therefore the you know that again led to a lot of special data which are required for GIS kind of analysis. The architecture and environmental sensitive planning, groundwater, vegetation, soil. You know, when the uh, when the planning of the natural resources. Uh, started with a view of environmental sensitive planning, then we needed to feed in the information which are related to groundwater, vegetation, and soil. Then we needed to stack that data in some kind of a layers and then analyze them that data together. And that is where again the GIS you know came into picture. It also has a very strong urban and demographic roots because you know uh, you know, the population census has been going on for again for many, many years uh, in different parts of the world. But then, you know, those data generally existed as, as tables, as graphs, etc., and so on. But then uh, when the GIS, you know, started to uh, be used in that, then you could display that information, you know, as to how the uh, population spreads out in different parts of the world or in different parts of the country, how this has been changing through time because you now have added the times a sense to that data and so on. And then of course, as I said, the remote sensing data that combines the information you know, from any other data sets, you know, maps you know, uh, and, and any other uh, you know, vector data sets, they have of course been very powerful use of the GIS as well. So this is basically how the GIS you know, started. Now, you know, let's look at the definitions first a little bit. Uh, you know, uh, now GIS, you know, in a, in a GIS system, every information is tied to some sort of a specific set of locations. So that's the spatial context is very, very important. Uh, and, and, you know, so we often use the word called geospatial, which is almost same as GIS, which also includes information which is tied to, you know, certain frames, you know, for example, other than Dave's, you know, uh, purpose. But then the geospatial data is also used in other contexts, for example, uh, you know, in, in the context of human building, human, human body, a medical imaging, for example, building, architectural drawing, for example, and so on. They also use, they also use these words called geospatial, et cetera, and so on. So, but then the fundamental point is that any kind of geographical information like, you know, location of a mine, city, power plants, uh, and which they, and then they attributes like lithology, elevation, you know, you know and landform, uh, and they are, you know, attached to that. So there are two kinds of geographical information, you know, to this. One is the uh, location itself, and the other is the attribute related to that location. For example, what is the rock type of that location? What is the elevation of that location? What is the landform of that location? What is the population of that location? And so on. These are called attributes of that particular position, and they are then tied together so that you can handle that together. Now. So the idea is to be able to handle the spatial position and the attributes together in some kind of a digital you know, processing form. So that is the you know the object of the uh, GIS data processing, for example, right? Uh, so, so basically, we have a digital notion to the data. We also have the ability to interact with that data. So it is human interaction. You know, if you, even if you have the same kind of a data, uh, two different individuals might be asking different questions. So there is a human interaction part as well, and then there has to be a special decision support system as to how do you support uh, that kind of a data. And there are some examples here. You can have uh, uh, remote sensing data, you can have several kinds of maps, you can have an attribute table, and then you, you know, put up all of that into digital data format. You can then analyze the data you know, in terms of lithology, in terms of distribution of the lithology, in terms of distribution of other parameters like fracture density, porosity, et cetera, and so on. So these are, the basic, you know, thing which we do. I know we will learn more as we as we go along. Now, before we go ahead, it is very important to understand that uh, you know the that the GIS is not just a digital representation of the geographical information. Okay, so for example, if you simply digitize a map, 
it doesn't become a GIS. You know, if, you know the GIS, you know, should be able to allow you to analyze the information contained in that map, you know, and connect it to other data set. For example, you may have all kinds of data sets like that. Uh, street data, building data, vegetation data, or integrated data, and if you you should be able to combine all of these data sets, you know, in a in a in a single frame, and that is where your integrated JS data set is actually coming in. And when you combine this data set, you know, today it's very easy to understand. You everybody uses a Google Map. You you type in a location in a Google Map. And then it tells you where you are, you know, or how should you go. For example, you give you directions to go in there. But there is a lot of backend processing happening when you are putting in that data. So there is already some of the data is existing. But then when you are asking that question as to what is the best route to reach that location, that you know that question is being analyzed in the backend, and then it is providing you data, keeping in consideration, for example, the traffic keeping in consideration the, you know, the congestion, keeping in consideration the shortest route, all of that information is being analyzed in the back end by Google. And then that is providing you, uh, you know, the, the, the information. So Google map is a, you know, is a classic example of how the GIS has become almost an everyday use material, for example, right? So Google is not just a map. It's, you know, because the, the maps are limited. Maps are static. They cannot be changed. They have a 2D information. They are projecting a flat, you know, uh, you know, uh, curved surface of the earth is projected as a flat. They are apparently exact, but then there are no cartographic checks, for example, and they are unconnected to other information, right? Which is not the case with the GIS, right? You are you are connecting all the information, and for example, if you are asking the address of a particular building, you know, then you are connecting the building to the geographical location. Uh, you are asking, you may be asking other information about that building, etc., and so on. So there is a difference between a simple map and the GIS data sets here. Now the spatio-temporal, you know, the GIS also has a temporal context, right? right? Because it is not just a space, because that data is being stored, you know, on, as, as a time series. You can also analyze the data in terms of time, time related changes. So this is basically uh, some sort of information science for a spatio-temporal phenomena, you know. Uh, so for example, in an empirical sense, it can capture the spatio-temporal properties of lakes, cities, forests, as accurately as possible. Uh, in a formal sense, it can be based on a property of lines, property of you know, lines, points, area, and pixels, and on the constants of the digital representation. We'll talk about all of that in a minute. And uh, then it can also be experimental. It can use a device to con convert, for example, the graphics and other data set back into the expert, you know, geographical understanding. You may have a you know, paper map, but you can digitize using uh, a digitizer and then convert that into an exp you know, into a, a spatial data. And then, of course, you can also have a lot of social inquiries focusing on ontology of the interest, focusing on the population distribution, for example, and so on. So all of these are possible, you know, to do that, uh, you know, in, in a GIS mode, for example. So let's look at what are the geographical concepts we are dealing with in a GIS. Uh, number one, that uh, we call something as geographical entities. These are the static things which exist. You know, these are like, for example, a small village or a square uh, or as, a, as large as the planet, uh, like mountain, river, valleys, coastline, etc. These are the static geographical entities on the planet. Okay. Then we call something as phenomena, which are things that happen. These are dynamic phenomena, for example, fires, for example, weather information, for example, floods, drought, erosion, urban growth. These are phenomena. And one of the very important things that GIS does is that it connects the geographical entities with the phenomena. So what GIS is actually trying to do is to connect the static entities with the dynamic phenomena, right? And then you create you know, or, you know, spatial information out of that. And then you can answer all questions which are related to where, uh, for example, lat long related terms, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And information related to when, for example, clock time, date, uh, when did uh, that flood happen? When did the maximum extent of a flood happen? When did 
of the urban growth in a given area started? All of these questions can be answered by looking at or analyzing the kind of a data which we have in a GIS format. So let's try to understand what are we representing, okay? When you talk about the spatial representation, we talk about the real world, which consists of many geographical entities, like you know, population, geology, topography, land cover, hydrology, geomorphology. All of that has to be represented, you know, in a, in a GIS mode. Okay, some of them are, can occur as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a map, some of them can occur as a data like population, some of them can uh, occur as tables, but all of them has to be, ha can be integrated together in a GIS mode. Okay, so let's first understand, we just understood the entities and, and phenomena. We also should understand what is entities and what is an object. Now, as I just explained, entities are the things in the real world, a mountain, a river, uh, you know, a land, uh, these are entities, basically. But then when you represent those entities in the digital world, they become objects for us, right? So they, so there are digital objects, and then you, you, there are associated attributes to that, you know? So for example, a uh, river will have an attribute in terms of its width, its length, et cetera, and so on. A land will have an attribute in terms of its location, for example. So everything, you know, these informations are basically fed into the system to prepare the GIS data sets here, right? So, so there are entities and there are objects like that, basically, okay? Now, the other difference which has to be understood is the fields versus entities, okay? Now, there are many geographical phenomena which are described scientifically. For example, topographic elevation, air temperature, soil, temp soil, soil content, uh, moisture, etc. Okay, these are basically called fields. Okay, when you are representing that these kind of a data set in a GIS mode, uh, then we call them as you know field. They are not. Uh, they are phenomena, of course, but then they have to be represented as some kind of a value. Topographic elevation will have a value. Air temperature will have a value, for example. Okay. And then these fields can be continuous fields or can be discrete as well. A continuous field, for example, any dependent variable which are measured on our interval scale. You know, we are, for example, you are representing topographic data as a contour or as a ratio scale, for example. Temperature is being represented at, you know, in degree centigrade, for example. These are continuous data sets and you can degenerate contours or some kind of a map out of that kind of a data. But then there are also discrete fields. There are, you know, independent, you know, nominal dependent variables. For example, you can also represent topographic data as a spot height, as an, or as an ordinal variable like drainage density, for example, low, medium, high. So there are many ways the fields are represented, either as a continuous field or as a discrete field. But the, question, the fundamental point is that any geographical phenomena can be represented either as a field or as a collection of digital objects like entities, for example, right? So, so depending upon, you, if, you, if you are representing a mountain, that's a digital entity, that's a digital object. But if you want to also add information about that mountain in terms of, let's say, topographic height of that mountain or elevation distribution you know, around that mountain, then this has to be represented as a field. So there is also field and entities, you know? So we have now learned many things, entities, objects, fields, and, you know, and, and fields, of course, there are three, three different things, right? Okay. Now, let's, you know, understand in a very simple way, what is the basic data structure which we are going to put in, you know, in a GIS mode? Now, you know, you are all familiar with a map. You know, any map, you know, is, is you know, will have a certain representation of, let's say, a rock type called granite. Uh, you might have a, a road, you know, being shown, you know, like that. You might have the uh, location of a query, you know, which is marked here on a map, or you might have some vegetation patches which are mapped here like that. So these are simple things to understand. But when you want to represent that data in a, in a GIS mode, there are two things. One, that you can represent, some of the data set will have to be represented as a vector. Uh, you know, for example, a road has to be shown as a line like that. The boundary of the uh, you know that rock has to be shown as a 
as a granite, you no know, like that. So this is again a you know a vector. Uh, then the patch of vegetation is shown here as a, as a vector, as a polygon, for example. And then the location of the query is shown as a point, for example, right? So that's a vector representation of the data. You can also represent the same data as a, as a raster, you know, in a grid format, for example. So in a grid format, you can see that you know, depending upon the position of the this particular feature, you can see that this road is shown as a as a grid, you know, like that. So that's a grid representation of a road. A point is shown, a query is shown as a point, okay, and then uh, uh, the area of the granite rock is shown as a as an area like that, okay, and then you have a vegetation patch which is shown like that. So all the grids, you know, are filled with the information. All it shows that in this particular grid, the vegetation is present, in this particular grid, the road is present, and in this particular grid, the query is present. So that's a raster representation of that kind of a data here. Okay. Then let's, so, so therefore, you know, uh, any geographical data, therefore, will have two things. One is a spatial location of that data, which is a measured X, Y location. You know, you, you, I just showed you there can be a point, there can be a line, there can be a polygon, or there can be a surface, okay? You can also have the topological location of that data. You can represent them as a raster grid data, or you can represent them, which is also called an arc node representation. Cartographers use that. So, you know, so there is a, any point which is joined, any two points can be joined as a, with a line. So the points are basically called a node and the joining line is called an arc. So this is an arc and node representation of that. Then you will have an attribute of that, you know, feature. So for example, a line can be a road, you know, and that road uh, might be an interstate road or it can be a simple, you know, lane, for example. A slope, may have a value, you know, and then it will have a descriptor. So a value is 45 degree and a descriptor is T, for example, right? Similarly, a road, you have given a value of one to, let's say, interstate road. You have given a value of two to, let's say, a lane, for example. So that's another dimension of that. The you're, you're describing that data in the form of the attributes. Now, there's a third dimension here, and that is a time. So you may have the same data for different times. For example, if new roads are being built up, you are adding that data. So one road may be built up in 1970, the second road might have come in 1980 and so on. So there's a time series of the same data set you're also building through time, okay? So the geographical data therefore has a spatial context, has an attribute, and also has a time context of that. So this is how the data is actually being built in the GIS, you know, you know GIS mode. Now let's understand the dimensionality. You know, I just talked about this, but let's put it in a more formal way. So any data which is going in the GIS mode has, you know, has a dimensionality. It has a point, it can be a line, it can be an area, or it can be a surface. Okay. Now let's understand this in terms of the real world entity and in terms of the digital object. So let's say in the real world entity, there can be an individual disease case, uh, it can be a point. Okay. A line uh, can be a, a road or a path you take from your home to go to work, for example. That can be a line. That can be represented as a line, for example. Uh, area can be a property ownership, for example. A, surf a surface can be population density surface, for example. Now, in the, these real world entities can become a digital object as a, a coordinate. It can become a street segment coordinate. It can be a, become a land parcel, area can become a land parcel, or a surface can become an elevation model, for example, right? Why it is important to do that and represent that? Because the analysis and the, and the visualization technique for these things are different. Uh, so the point data set can be analyzed by various methods called, for example, uh, nearest neighbor analysis, boundary generation, surface generation, and so on. Lines can be analyzed by network functions, topological analysis. Area can be analyzed by area interpolation, surface generation, and similarly, surface can be analyzed for slope calculation, dam dem creation, et cetera, and so on, right? Similarly, we can visualize the data set in different forms as points, as line, as area cartograms, or as isoline mapping, or tin mapping, or a 3D you know, visualization, and so on, okay? 
So there are standard ways of representing the data and then visualizing that data as well. And then of course, you know, all of these, you know, data set eventually add, you know, uh, provide information when you want to integrate them together, for example, right? For example, how much, how a particular point is distant from a second point. So you have to have that point data and then you have to have a line which is connecting those points as well. And also, how do you want to travel to that point? Are you traveling between the two points by a road or by a rail or by an air? So all of this information has to be fed in just so that you can get the right answer to that as well. Now, so therefore, if you understand all of this so far, uh, then how do we analyze that data? So analysis of that the GIS data needs two things. One, there's a hardware component where all the data sets are being stored, you know, you know, a plus displayed, and you might even have a printing device, for example. There's also a software module wherein you feed in the data, you verify the data, you analyze the data, you put the data in a uh, in, a, in, a, in a different structure, you analyze, you store the data in a different format, for example. You analyze the data for, for a different kind of visualization. You also arrange the data so that it can interact with different users in a different way. You know, for example, as I said, same data set might generate different questions by different people. And your module, your GIS module can be, should be able to answer all of that. So this is how we, you know, we design the whole system. Now let's you know get into some integrity you know nitty gritty of that. One is how do you feed the data? So obviously there are, as I said, there are two types of data we are dealing with: spatial data, which is you know you can put it the data in a manual input through a vector system. You can uh, put it into a grid system. You can digitize the data. You can scan the data. All of these modes are possible to do that. And then uh, the non-spatial, the attributes are generally entered you know uh, with values. There are again. You can enter them as a table or you can enter them as you know some other mechanism by digitization of the points and so on. And then to link this, to link the spatial and the non-spatial data, you design special programs. There are procedures for doing that. There are format conversion. There are data reduction strategies. There are error detection strategies and then editing of the data. You then have to merge points into lines and lines into polygons. You have to match the edges of the two land parcels, for example. You have to rectify the data, register the data. You, have to, you may even have to interpolate. For example, if you have point data sets, you need to generate a contour out of that. So you can do interpolate the data in between the two. You then may have to also do some photo interpretation of the data. So these are you know, generally done through special programs. There are programs to do that, and there are you know, backend you know, uh, software which are written you know, to do that kind of a thing, for example. So, okay, I obviously, you know, I mean, a GIS kind of a you know, subject can be offered for a full semester as a full semester course. It's very hard. To you know, to con to 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 you know, to concise that in a, in a, in an hour, but let me try. Uh, okay, now let's understand the data structure and representation. As I said, you are dealing with three you know different kind of data sets: point, lines, area, and surface, right? And so I will talk about the you know in a very short form uh, the two different kinds of data formats. There are vector data model. Uh, which are simple like uh, Cartesian coordinate models. And there are topographic, topological vector models, which are based on nodes and areas. There are also raster data model. We'll talk about that also, traditional raster model, and also the quarterly raster data model as well. Okay. Uh, very simple in a way, you know, there are, this, these are really complicated topics. You know, these are dealt with, with a lot of care. Uh, so let's understand in a very simple way, what is a vector Cartesian model, okay? Uh, you know, as I said, you may have an original map, uh, which are, you know, which have, which have a, which have an area, you know, which is, let's say, given a, you know, notation of 31, you may have a point, you may have a line. So there are three kinds of data sets, point, lines, and polygons, okay? Now, uh, this map can be represented as Cartesian coordinates, you know, in a Cartesian, Cartesian coordinate system. So each point here, which you see, are basically fed as a Cartesian, Cartesian. So each point is given a coordinates in, in, in let's say, an X, Y coordinate system. And, and then when you are, so you, what you do, you digitize this, you know, this shape into, uh, let's say, 10, 20 different points. And each point is then given 
a lat long position or an xy coordinate set. It's simple xy coordinate. You're only representing, uh, you know, uh, these as different. And then the when you join these points, you will basically generate the surface, right? Similarly, point data is simple. You have just one point. You define the xy coordinate of that point in the xy coordinate system, and that's it. Similarly, a line can also be, you know, represented as a series of points which are eventually joined together to generate a line. Okay. So therefore, what you have done, you have generated a point, you have given a number to that feature 11, and you have generated that as a symbol x, y point. You have generated a line, which you have designated as, let's say, a point feature as 21, and this line is represented as a series or string of points. And then you have generated a polygon, you have given a number 31, and you have generated this as a closed loop system. So that's basically uh, a Cartesian coordinate based representation of the of the data here okay similarly the same kind of or similar kind of a data can be represented as a topological vector model you know as i just explained a while ago in the uh, vector model uh, you represent the points as a node and you then join the different nodes to generate the node you know the uh, the uh, uh, the polygon or to to arc okay so any 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 line which is joining the uh, two points are basically called arc, and then when you have a closed arc, it becomes a polygon, for example, right? So this is a polygon. So this one is an arc. So all of these, so the number of this 45 is a point. Uh, all of these are nodes, and all of these are individual lines are basically arc. And then you have this red thing, which I have pointed out here is a, is a complete polygon. Okay, so what you have done in this representation that you can now represent uh, let's say, uh, you know, uh, uh, polygon number uh, 45 or polygon number 47 as a 45 number polygon is basically an arc list of 1732. Okay. So, you know, so, you know, so basically this number seven, uh, number three and number two. So this is basically defining the polygon number 45. Okay. Similarly, polygon number 46 uh, can be defined as uh, arc list of 2, 5, 10, and 4. So 2, 5, 4, and 7. Okay, so that's how you define that. You can then also define, you know, that, you know, you can also define each of the polygons as a parcel. So 45, you know, polygon has been given a parcel number of, let's say, 501 as an identifier. This is an identifier, basically, right? And 46 has been given a number of 502. 47 has been given a number of 503. These are parcel numbers which are you know, which are which have some other you know notation and notation you know in, in that context for example now <clears throat> let's talk about you know our remote sensing data these are as i said before remote sensing data are generally raster data sets right so there are uh, you know so the raster data sets have a lot of value you know in terms of uh, you know, in, in, the, in the GIS because they are one of the most commonly used data sets in the GIS kind of a modeling. So there is a lot of data sets available, uh, for example, in terms of land use and land cover data. So, you know, so you have information about, let's say, urban or built up land, agricultural land, range land, all kinds of. So what is, you know, what a particular land parcel at a given location is being used for at the moment uh, or at a given time is available to you, and then that data is now can be can be used as a GIS mode. More, more. Then you have a lot of DEM data. So DEM data means elevation data. These are again available either as grids or as contours or as profiles or there is something called a triangular irregular, irregular network thin format. Don't worry about it. But these are basically you know, spatial data, raster data set, but these are three-dimensional. Remember that all elevation data will be three-dimensional because they will have X, Y, and also a Z, you know, coordinate system attached to that because every X, Y coordinate must have an elevation. And therefore, you should be able to represent the elevation data in any kind of a surface, basically. Okay, a map is a, is a, is a, is a, is a plane surface, 2D, 2D surface, and then will be a 3D surface, for example, right? So these are some of the very common, you know, uh, raster data set which we use for our, you know, uh, from apart from the remote sense images, 
um, you know, and then you have land use, land cover kind of data, and then you have the dem data sets here. These are very commonly used raster data sets which we use. Now, how do we represent the raster data? You know, or uh, now again, same example as I showed before, but instead of using the space, you know, the Cartesian coordinate system, we will now try to represent that data, you know, in a in a raster format. So this map has to be represented in a grid format. So what I will, what I have done here, uh, because this this has been labeled as thirty one. Okay, so every point on that grid, this you know the boundary of this shape is passing through. This has been you know digitized as a as a as a surface here, right? So this is the surface you want to represent this in a, in a, in, a, in a grid system. Point is of course a one single point, and then this line is again a point here. So all this has a number. Or ID of 21. So every grid has been filled with this information that this grid, you know, contains information about the line, which is basically 21 here. Okay. So that's how you are representing the data set in a, in a raster or a grid format data set here. Okay. Now you can imagine very well uh, that this is a very cumbersome way. Uh, it doesn't matter. Your data set may be contained in a very small area, but you have to still provide information for the entire grid. Even if the information is zero, you have to tell the computer that this information is zero. Okay. So therefore, so basically what you are trying to do, you are trying to store information for each row and column with a value. Okay. So for example, here row one, column one has to be zero, row one, column two has to be zero again, and so on. Row three, column three has to be 31, and so on. So each and every uh, grid of you know this information has to be filled in basically obviously uh, you know sometimes the information you know is less but your your storage will be very large so how do we counter that how do, what is a more effective way of storing such kind of a data set so that that is where we come with come up with a quarterly raster data model so that's the standard this this what what i showed you is a traditional raster you know, model, we use another thing which is called a quarterly data raster data model, where what we do is that we divide the entire area into you know, uh, quadrants. So for example, I divide the whole area into four quadrants, 0, 1, 2, and 3. Now for this, you know, for, this for 0 and, and 1, uh, let's say the information is same. So okay, so I just feed in the information, let's say agriculture class, for example, right? Uh, now for the entire grid three, let's say the information available is forest. I only have to feed one information and that is forest. Budget, okay. But for this, you know, grid, grid number two, I have, you know, a lot of heterogeneity in the system. I have commercial areas, I have industrial areas, I have single family residential areas, I have something called A, B, whatever, and so on. Okay. A is agriculture, B is multi, multiple family residential and so on. So what I do again, I divide this entire grid into again several quadrants. Uh, you know, first divide that into four quadrants, again divide that into four, and then again, if need be, divide that into four, and so on. And then I code that. So I, I code that into two zero, two one, two two, and two three. So even even here, I'm saving the information. I don't have to feed information for all the grids. You no, know, this this is again in the traditional grid format. You will have multiple grids here as well. But since the information is same, I don't have to divide that. I feed the same information to here. But here, I have to further divide that. If need be, I may have to further divide that, for example, and so on. So given the heterogeneity of the, of the area, I can use the quarterly raster data model to minimize the storage space. And therefore, this is a more effective way of saving the information. So this is basically how the data set is represented. You know, this is called a quartry model. So this is basically the first order leaf, 0, 1, 2, 3. Then you can have the second order leaves, which is called nodes, uh, 2, 0, 2, 1, 2, 2, 2, 3. And then this can have further division of 2, 1, 0, 2, 1, 1, 2, 1, 2, 2, 1, 3, and so on. And each of these can be coded into, you know, into in terms of attributes. So you can now attach, you know, attributes to each of these layers. So one is zero is agriculture, one is agriculture, uh, you know, amongst two, two zero is commercial, two one again has further divisions and so on. Okay. So all you have to do is to feed the information for each quadrant and that quadrant can be of different sizes. Therefore, you save 
a lot of storage and therefore also the processing time, which is going to be uh, used up for uh, info and for deriving information out of that. So, so now that brings us to uh, the cartographic modeling concept. You know, so the cartographic modeling is basically in that involves cartographic modeling is now how are we deriving information from that data by decomposition of the data set by processing the data and then by recombining the data for you know for deriving that information. So what cartographic modeling does that depending upon your query, depending upon the problem, it generates a, a new layer, okay, which is basically a function of the old layer plus the question how, okay? So how is related to your question? How, what is the question you are trying to ask? So basically what you're doing in this step, you are converting data into information, okay? So we, so far, we only talked about the data part of it, right? Now we are talking about converting the data into information by asking the question and by I, and, and then by designing, you know, the data processing modules accordingly, for example, okay? Now this step, you know, uh, many times would need transformation of the data. For example, uh, you may have to perform or ask the computer to perform local operation. For example, uh, you want a new value for each location. You know, you can, uh, so for example, you can give, you know, uh, uh, you can have uh, some different values of uh, a location. For example, uh, you know, three different districts and, uh, uh, three or five different villages in the same district, you want to add that information, uh, and let's say in terms of population. So you basically add that information and you generate a new information of P plus Q plus R, for example. You can then have a journal operation. You can assign a new value for each location as a function of the existing value from the specified layer. For example, you can create different zones Okay, and then you can create, uh, uh, you know, uh, a new information for each. You can divide the whole area into different zones, and then you can create, uh, you know, the zonal sum. For example, you can ask, okay, this is my total district. This district has three different villages, and what is the uh, total population of each of the villages, for example? So rather than giving you the total value of the whole district, you can ask, you know, you can ask, you know, the ordinate data for each of the uh, different villages as well I have, I have different zone for example you can also design incremental operation for example you can uh, characterize each location with an increment of you know p plus one for example uh, you can compute slope uh, you know you know you can add certain number to a certain value you remember we talked about adding sometimes there are zero values you know in a data set and if you want to you know, add a, a digit, let's say one or two to that. So these are incremental gradient operations. You can compute slope at each location on a 3D surface by using the incremental operation. Similarly, you can design a focal operation. For example, you can actually, uh, you know, calculate a new value as a function of, let's say, existing value, distance, uh, difference, uh, you know, of with a, with, a, with a certain number and so on. So basically you can create again a new layer which will be, which will have the value of that particular point uh, depending upon the question you are asking. You know, for example, you're asking that, okay, what is the total population of this particular point or this particular, or, or what is the total elevation? Or what is the elevation of this particular point and how is that distributed, for example? Or how this point is uh, distant from, uh, let's say, a given reference point, for example. You can design any, num any number of questions and then answer that using this kind of operations as well, okay? So these are, so there are always, but again, remember that these kind of transformations are happening in the back end of the GIS module. You're only designing a question, but then you must have the necessary data available to perform these operations. That's the important point of, you know, here. Okay, then many times you would need some measurements to be done. You, you may want to calculate the area of a given, you know, given polygon. You might you may want to calculate the volume of certain, you know, things. For example, you know, you may want to calculate the distance between the two points. These require measurements. For example, okay, uh, that's one thing. These are again cartographic operations. Then sometimes you may have to overlay different layers, you know, uh, and then ask the questions accordingly. For example, give me a, uh, give me a, you know, uh, a total 
uh, uh, you know, a population of different uh, different communities, for example. You give me a, a disease spread in different areas, for example, and so on. Okay. Then you sometimes you also uh, do neighborhood operations like geographic search, topographic function, interpolation, all of that. So let's look at some of these things as well, you know, you know very, very quickly. Uh, so let's say measurement operation. Okay. Uh, very simple measurement operation is that you want to calculate certain numbers. You may have certain numbers. Each point uh, may have certain numbers. You want to just sum up. Uh, you may want to sum up for the whole area or you may want to sum up for certain polygons. Okay. So you, and you, these polygons are also available to you. So let's say you divide the whole area into three different polygons and you want the numbers to be calculated for each of the polygons. So that's a simple uh, point, you know, uh, you know, sum up, sum operation here. You want to calculate distance between the two points like that, which could be a straight line or which could be a curved line, for example. That's a distance calculation. You want to calculate the area of a given, you know, a given polygon, for example, uh, you know, uh, that, or you want to calculate this, the perimeter of a, uh, of, of a certain loop, for example. These are area-related operations. You want to calculate a volume uh, of a given area. For example, if an area has been excavated, uh, before and after, if you have the elevation data for that, you can actually calculate how much volume of the soil has been excavated from that area. So all you need to know then, therefore, the cross section you know, of that area before and after the excavation, or you need some sort of elevation data before and after the excavation. So you have two surfaces before the excavation and after excavation, and you take a difference of the two, you know, uh, elevation map, and then you calculate the total volume. So all of these operations are very simple operations in, in the GIS if you have the necessary data available. Now, you know, another thing which I just talked about is the vector polygon overlay. Okay. Now, vector polygon overlay allows you to overlay different information and then uh, extract the necessary information. For example, you may have a land parcel data, which are again, you know, numbered 45, 46, 47. You may have a soil map available as well, which are again, let's say numbered uh, 88. You know, these are attributes, these are just IDs of uh, 88 can be, for example, stable soil, a uh, 90 could be unstable soil. Uh, you know, parcel ID 45 may belong to 501 or 502 or whatever and so on. Now, you want to calculate a new layer of stability, you know. So basically, you want to know how each of these parcels are stable you know, or non-stable, for example. So you combine these two layers, you overlay one and two another, and then you create a new layer which has now IDs of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, for example. And each of these stability ID now has, you know, are associated with the original parcels. Okay. But you have now classified each of these, you know, I, each of these IDs into stable or into unstable, for example. So these are simple overlay uh, which you are creating. I, I, again, you can have any kinds of data onto that, for example. So that's a simple vector polygon overlay. You are, these are vector data set. You are just simply overlaying the two different vector and polygons, and then you know, and then deriving the necessary information out of that. You can also overlay the raster polygon, for example. Do you already have a raster data available and uh, information available, you know, in, in the let's say this form, uh, let's say soil slope and access. You know? uh, so basically, again, you have, you know, you have. Uh, uh, you have uh, you overlay these all of these layers into and you have created a new layer. For example, you may have just sum up. You have created a local sum here. For example, a new layer of suitability you are calculating here, which is a function of soil slope and access. And you have given some weightage to that. You have given one weightage to soil, two weightage to slope, and one weightage to access. And then you create a local product function, you know, and then you sum these areas, and then you create a new number. Okay. So these are obviously, since, you know, as for the weightage, you have added these numbers and you've created new numbers. Obviously, the highest numbers here are the most suitable and the lowest numbers here are the least suitable. Here. So these are the two data, you know, multiple data sets being added, you know, you know in, in a raster mode, I simply, you know, uh, applying some local add functions and so on. Remember, these are very simple examples I'm trying to give you, but in the real world, you may be performing much more complex you know, functions and because your needs may be quite different here as well. 
Then there are simple matrix analysis. You know, simple matrix analysis can be done as well. You can have data sets present in, a, in different matrix, uh, soil type A, soil type B, soil type C, D, soil type E, F, and so on. And you can have a vegetation type, and then you can create this matrix, and then you can you know, basically combine the data sets into different kinds of types. So each time, now this matrix means that uh, this six class will have a soil type of CD and vegetation type of IJK, for example, right? So these are simple matrix you, know, you are creating. This matrix can be created from any of the previous operations which we talked about, but they represent the data in, a, in terms of a matrix, for example. Now, let's talk a little bit you know, different about geographical search, for example. Now, given all these data sets that you have, uh, how do you design, you know, different kinds of geological search, for example, okay? Now, for example, you have uh, these points, You this is your home. Uh, these are your, uh, you know, different kinds of roads uh, like these and, and like that and so on, okay? Uh, so you want to create, you know, a, a buffered area using a search distance. You want to, let's say, create, uh, give me a point which is, uh, less than certain you know meter from my home, for example, right? You created that, you know, so you created a buffer out of out of this area, and so these are the points which are giving you, uh, you know, uh, you know, some sort of uh, buffer of let's say ten meter from each point. So you created a area which is a buffered area like that. So around a point, you created a buffer around a point, for example, and you gave a search distance of let's say ten meter here. So you want to create. Know, delineate all these areas which are within 10 meters of you know these points for example that's one you know example you can also create similar kind of buffer around a line for example if this is a river for example you want to create a buffer zone around that river or around a highway for example uh, of a certain distance so that let's say you want to mark uh, those areas you want to protect those areas uh, for uh, you know for uh, introachment or for any other things and so on okay and you want to declare and notify this area so you and you can just define okay these are my features highway this is my river i want to create a five meter buffer around the river and a 10 meter buffer around the around the road it will create a map uh you know which will you know basically create those kind of buffered areas as well that's a simple, and then you can, you know, uh, uh, do whatever else you want to do, etc., and so on. You can also create a buffer around a parcel. Uh, you have a parcel. You have a already a defined land parcel, and you can create a, create a polygon around that parcel, uh, given a search distance of 10, 20, 50 meters, and so on. Okay. So these kind of operations are commonly used by planners uh, when they want to buffer certain areas. Uh, for certain use, for example, and so on. These are very, very powerful functions which are available in GIS port. Then there are, you know, topographic functions available, uh, which are very important for, uh, you know, remote sensing investigations. For example, elevation data, slope data, and aspect data, they are often correlated with other variables, you know. For example, how the elevation data is related to, let's say, uh, the vegetation distribution, how a slope is related to a landslide, you know, uh, phenomena, for example. All of these data sets are, so here, the, these, these data sets and a particular phenomena are related, and you want to find those relationships. For example, therefore, you can actually, uh, you know, if you have, let's say, data of elevation and slope, you also have the data of the, the landslide, you know, locations, you can ask the computer to find if, what is the relationship between uh, let's say slope values of 30 to 40 degree and the landslide distribution, for example. So all kinds of functions can be performed you know, on that. Then you can also perform a map algebra function. You can, let's say, uh, create an increment gradient, compute slope, for example. You, have, you may have elevation data of different points and you can ask the computer to generate a slope map for that area. So how is the slope generated? Slope is the difference of elevation between two points. So obviously, you, you do not have the slope data directly, but you're asking the computer or JS to, to compute that slope, for example, because you have fed in the slope, you know, the, uh, the elevation data here, right? Similarly, you can ask the computer to uh, create a map of aspect, you know, how the direction of the slope is different in different parts of the... So all of these maps are created in a very simple, by a simple, you know, click function uh, using the JS kind of mode, et cetera, and so on. 
Now, finally, uh, the network analysis function. Again, there are lots of network analysis you want to do at some point. Uh, for example, you want to find out the shortest distance from one feature to another to optimize the vehicle routing. You know, these are generally used by uh, you know, the road planners, for example, how to you know optimize the the vehicle transport, etc., and so on. See earlier. Most of these things were done manually. Now that we have all the data sets available in a digital format, this can be done very, very quickly, for example. You can also uh, use a spread function, for example, to evaluate the transport time or cost over a complex surface. For example, how your cost of transport will be different if you use this route or if you use that route. Maybe you want to optimize your cost and time, for example, right? You want to, somebody may be willing to spend more time, but less cost, Somebody may be willing to, you know, uh, use, you know, uh, you want to use a shorter, you know, path, but uh, maybe it, it might cost more. Right? So all kinds of combination combinations are possible to do that, and you can design your question accordingly. Similarly, you can use a seek function to trace the path of the water flow over it. It is a very commonly used function which we use as as geomorphologists. Uh, if I have a DM, I want to find out what will be the path of flow of water or storm water or, or a flood water, for example. So these are used by hydrologists to map, to model the spread of the water in a given setting. You know, how much inundation will happen, how much will be the depth of the water in a given area and all of that. So these are typically, you know, used to do that. So therefore, the, the, the basic idea of the network analysis is that we want to understand and determine the interrelationships of various features in the landscape. Right? That is the idea of the network analysis. Again, as I said before, your questions, your needs, your requirements can be very different. But you know, you can you know, but then you can design your module as per as per your node, as per your needs, for example. Okay. To finish off, you know, a quick summary: uh, any GIS system is designed to allow the analysis of the spatial data to answer geographical questions. Anything which has a geographical context, anything which has a distance, point, area, anything related to that can be answered by that, okay? Uh, you know, some data you need to, uh, but then as I said, you need to feed that data into the system. And some of them can be fed as raster maps. Some of them might have to be fed as a vector, but, the power of the GIS is that it can combine all these different kinds of data sets as vectors or as 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 uh, as maps, and then analyze them together. Okay, so the idea is that all the spatial data can be transformed and analyzed as per the user's need. Remote sensing data sets are one of some of the most useful, you know, data sets which we use for our uh, different purposes: uh, forest, water, topography, etc. And uh, so therefore, I hope you can relate uh, why we need GIS data sets to perform, uh, you know, or to use our, GI, our remote sensing data set because all the remote sensing data sets are primarily spatial data sets. And if you want to ask any questions or perform any operations related to that, we need to have the knowledge of the GIS as well. So I finish up here and uh, for today, and it was you know it was a very nice experience interacting with you. And if you have any question for today's lecture, you can you are more than welcome to put your question in the chat box. Okay. Thank you so much for your attention, and I close that now. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sinha. This is uh, Dr. Soni Gupta joining from uh, CSJMU Kanpur University. Uh, so it was lovely hearing you and have been following you for the last uh, two lectures as well. It's uh -huh. a pleasure hearing to you. And But before I extend my appreciation from your busy schedule, these lectures, I, I like the candidates to please uh, write their queries or doubts in the chat box. So please, Rohit ji, can you please uh, allow the candidates to write the queries? Done, ma'am. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, one of the questions, the suppose question. if we have to arrange different agriculture input data that we have collected from a particular area, then how specifically we will represent it? Because you have explained various kinds of representation methods, so it's quite confusing for the specificity. No, no, this is very simple. 
you know the agricultural input data depends upon how you how you are collecting the data if it is already available as a map then you would enter them as a raster data if you are collecting them in the field then you will enter them as a point data and you know and then you will interpolate the data set to create the raster map eventually you need a raster map to analyze but it depends how you are collecting that data so then the uh, next question is sir what exactly is the use of creating a buffer and polygon around yeah. an area yeah as so, as i said you know for example you are you are trying to uh, locate a site for a waste disposal for example right now you want to uh, create a buffer whatever operation you want to do you want to exclude certain areas from that operation so you obviously you want you don't want any disposal site to be within 10 you know or 5 kilometer within the uh, around the river you don't want this to be very close to the road etc etc so you then you then need to buffer that area and then look for the site which are available outside those buffer areas so these are some of the operations which we normally do uh, the next question, sir, what is the difference in spatial and attribute data in GIS? No, the spatial data is a, is a, can be represented as a point line or polygon. Attribute is a descriptor. For example, a line uh, can be a road or it can be a river, for example. You describe that data. That is your attribute. You know, that is what we, we say that. And the next question is about the utility of GIS in uh, agriculture the query is why gis is important for horticulture or our agriculture as that information of gis is so costly how the small farmers can use it so i mean see it is not meant to be used by individual farmers but it is meant to be used by planners okay farmers you know can be advised accordingly by the planners uh, because we have such kind of a data available, so we can advise the individual farmers. Farmers are not obviously educated enough generally, uh, you know, to, to use that. But then, you know, there are many other ways by the by which the farmers use it. Now, nowadays, for example, information can be provided using the JS data modules as to when to plant a certain, you know, a certain crop, when to water, you know, uh, and so on. So all of these inventions are now available. There is something called an agropedia. I'm not sure if you're available, you know, if you're available, if you're aware of that. Agropedia has a lot of information which is fed in the in the GIS, and then farmer can ask questions accordingly. So there are multiple uses of that. Actually, there's a lot of appreciation from the candidates, sir. Uh, they have appreciated your presentation and your uh, teaching skills, as it is evident from your years of experience in research and teaching. One of the question is, what is the difference in GIS data models like raster and vaster? Uh, raster and? Vaster, yes. Uh, raster. I don't know what is raster, but uh -huh. I know about raster. I've never heard of this word called vaster. Okay. <laughs> Can we calculate NDVI? Yes. Yeah, NDVI, I, I explained that in the last lecture. It's a ratio. Uh, between the infrared band and the and the red band you can calculate ndvi and uh, again uh, it can be done very easily in a gis mode as well you know, using digital image processing for example many uh, candidates have uh, asked uh, and appreciated your ppts and want their ppts to be shared yes we'll be sharing it in the online mode and uh, yes we'll be uh, definitely sharing all this material uh, what is data model in gis uh, data model is, you know, as I explained, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a representation module. You know, you can represent the data in different kinds of models. As I explained, uh, you can explain, you, you can do that in a simple uh, raster mod, uh, model, which is, you know, which is a traditional model where you have to fill in each and every grid. You can also do that in a quarterly data uh, data model where, where every grid doesn't have to be filled and so on. So there are various kind of data structures and models which are available to, you know, for us to use. And then, depending upon the data set, we use a certain format. So, uh, these are, you know, uh, this is what the data model is. One of the comments is we need ARC GIS software too, sir. Uh, I mean, yes, you do, but then ARC GIS is a very expensive software. And I have, but then there are also uh, a free software which is called QGIS. If somebody is interested to use or, you know, want to follow up, they should follow, they should take the QGIS software, which is a free domain free software and it has almost equal capability as RGIS. Okay. So we have, for example, shifted to a QGIS long ago. We don't normally use RGIS for now, for example, because this is very expensive. You know, you need to pay a subscription fee, which is very, very high. 
Another appreciation from a candidate. Ex uh, excellent explanation of all questions from my side. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, I guess this is a one, one, one of the starting lectures on the awareness of GIS remote sensing and data processing, which you have been delivering, sir. And I've seen certain candidates uh, um, inquiring about uh, they want to learn the software also. So maybe you can guide them and uh, yeah, tell them sure. how. Yeah. I've given them the email. Anybody is free to write me an email and yeah. I'll be happy to provide any further yeah. information. This is like uh, creating awareness and there will be candidates who will be more streamlined in the process and gaining more expertise in this area. And of course, Dr. Rajiv Sinha will be helping out and guiding them in their careers also. Right, sir. So um, uh, I express sincerely my uh, gratitude and appreciation for the wonderful presentation. And of course, it shows the, your years of experience as uh, in research as well as teaching beautifully uh, explained these topics, which many people are, you know, not wanting to learn. <laughs> and uh, it was really wonderful hearing from you. And uh, there are a lot of lectures lined up for uh, various domains like UAV drones and robotics, phenomics, and uh, getting the candidates learn in the area of what is the future of precision farming. We have the next le lecture lined up um, from Dean uh, Agriculture, Shere Kashmir tomorrow. So candidates, please be with us. And uh, I extend thank you from all the candidates to your uh, precious time, sir. We love to associate in future too uh, with IIT as well as your lab in particular. So thanks a lot from my side, sir. Lovely. And any words of advice to sure. all the candidates here, sir. We'd love to hear from you. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you and good luck with the rest of the print training program. Thank you, sir. Thank sure. you. Bye -bye. Thanks a lot. Uh, we'll sign up, uh, sign off uh, for today, all the candidates, and we'll be telling you about the schedule uh, through the WhatsApp group. So thank you. <laughs>